What are, what are the biggest obstacles you face uh, what, generally in the tech world? Were you personally or generally in the tech world? What are the biggest obstacles to um, you know, spreading the cooperative ideal? Um, well, I think the, bi the biggest single issue at the moment really is finance. You know, if you want to start, if you want to start a business, I mean, you know, go back to the what we were talking about is platform co-ops. Right? So the everyone was talking about using cooperative models of ownership as a response to the so-called sharing economy. You know. Uh, people could see very quickly, well, this isn't a sharing economy at all. This is actually hyper-extractive, uh, and it's very damaging. And uh, Not everybody sees that, though, do they? Well, perhaps not, yeah. But, but yeah, the, the, it was a sort of, the cooperative, the platform co-op thing was seen as a, it was a sort of a kickback against that. Um, you know, how do we how do we challenge that? So, um, okay, well, let's, why, why don't we uh, have a, a uh, uh, you know, cooperatively own platform. Well, the, there are lots of high costs involved in establishing those sorts of um, those businesses, those, those platforms. So it's not just about building the technology, which is obviously difficult and expensive in its own right, but it's also about uh, reaching the market. You know, and if you're trying to compete against something like Uber, I mean, the latest report I saw a couple of days ago, a week ago, from Uber is that it's on schedule to lose a billion dollars. Well, I think it was 4.6 billion last year yeah, or something yeah. like the that. Numbers, the numbers are eye-watering. Yeah. The amount of money that they're burning to, to grow their business and develop their business. And the same with Amazon. You look at Amazon. You know, it's only in recent months started to turn a profit. I and mean, in all those years, we're going to, can't remember when Amazon started, but it was probably 20 years old. And it's, from the vast majority of that time, it's never made a profit. Well, you've got to spend lots of money putting the, put, putting the competition out of business first, don't yeah, you? That's right. So you've got this sort of, uh, this capitalist model, which isn't about making a profit in the short term. It's about market dominance. And you, you, invest and you invest and you invest and you keep pouring money in because the VCs have got essentially limitless supplies of capital available yeah. to to build that market dominance. And it's not about making a profit, it's about building the share price so that they've got a good exit strategy when they want to get out. Yeah. Um, they can make a, bag, a, a killing off it. And it doesn't matter that the business isn't making any money. It's it's just sort of rolling out like this monster uh, steamroller sort of process, crushing everything in its path. And eventually there will be so little choice left that it, it will then be able to uh, charge what it likes. You know, it will, it will, they'll be able to make a profit on it or sell. But, what do you think? What, what's the best thing that individuals can do to help? Um, I think the best thing that individuals can do is is to collectivize essentially if you know, the, um, I'm a big fan of um, Douglas Roscroft the American yeah. uh, commentator and writer so yeah, it, it, one of the things that he talks about is, is finding the others and um, you know so and I think that um, and that's where I think is where the strength of the cooperative model really lies. You know? So I think what we've seen in, if you look at, for example, in the sort of fair trade or ethical consumerism, all of that stuff, um, it's it's been there. It's been effective as a campaigning lobby, I suppose, in sort of raising awareness of some of the issues. But in terms of actually changing the structure of the market, I don't think it had any significant impact, really. Not really, not really. I mean, that's debatable, I guess, and it might be in, that in some sectors it has been a major, uh, major force. But overall, it hasn't changed the game. 
overall is still quite marginal. Yes, I mean, I think I like I like the idea of fair trade. It's great, but it's yeah. it, it hasn't it hasn't changed the game. No, you're right. It doesn't change the game. So, and that's about individuals acting and using the, their power as a consumer to try and uh, shift them. Okay, so that has some effect, but it is marginal. I think only by by uh, finding the others, by collectivizing, using the power of uh, that exists within the cooperative model, then you can build enterprises that are much more powerful and can actually uh, then create real change. And how do you find the others? Help has got a whole set of challenges alongside it, obviously. But getting so, money into that machine is really, really difficult. So, yeah, how do you how do you finance these things? Because so, yeah, that's the question. Then, how do you find how do we finance these things? Well, I think it's difficult. I think that that um, you know we're within the cooperative economy in the UK. I think we're we're not innovating enough on that level. I think so. Uh, if you look at uh, you know, the big sources of finance for, for cooperative enterprises in the UK are the sort of a community share crowdfunding type model, which is great. That can be very effective. Um, or there's debt finance. You know, there's no, there's no sort of, uh, we've got nothing to compete with, with venture capitalism, mm. really. So what yeah. might that be? Um, I'm not sure, to be honest with you. I'm not an expert in that field. I think that there are some uh, investors uh, that are coming forward and uh, looking at different models. You know, they want to get a return, but um, you know, the whole. If you look at the VC model and how it works, it's essentially gambling. Okay, so that they they've got a big pile of cash, and they'll divvy it up into ten chunks or whatever, and they'll invest that in ten startups, and they hope that one of those startups will succeed, and give them you know a, a five hundred x return or something like that on their investment. The rest of their money will get burnt, and they'll lose it. So that's the way that they're gambling. Um, and if you look at how they operate, they're not particularly uh, expert in how they gamble. They, you know, they've got some insight, obviously, because they're, they, but they're, they're, their odds don't improve over time, particularly. You know, they're as clueless as the rest of us, really, about whether a particular uh, business idea is going to is going to succeed or not. But the problem with their model is that it's all consumer. So if you're a startup and you go for VC money, um, then, well, that's the end of your control of that business, essentially. The moment you do a deal with the VC, they're in control. Yeah. Okay. So, and that's why co-ops uh, can't, uh, can't use that model. So we need we need a different model. We need a we need a model of patient capital that is that respects the sovereignty of the cooperative members and looks for a, a a return which is more equitable. Um, well, I, I, maybe, I, I, maybe I, the I, fair shares stuff that um, is being developed. Yeah. Is, part of the solution there. So that allows an investor class to be accommodated within the cooperative model. Uh, so that, 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 that may be part of the mix. You've got a couple of organizations. There's an there's a organization I'm aware of, I think they're based in Switzerland, called um, oh, the name is, oh, Purpose Capital. All right? Purpose Capital. So, so their model is that they don't, they're not in, but they're not interested in um, a seat on the board or anything like that. They don't want that ownership stake. So their their return is based on uh, as a, a share of the profit. So they take a share of the profit that's made. So they're not. Um, 
You don't have to control. For, the, for a longer term, it's a longer term investment. So I, 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 try, to, I try to stay optimistic. I, I often say that capitalism itself grew in the cracks in feudalism. So you had your, you had your money lenders and your, your itinerant merchants, and they, it didn't look likely that they were going to rise in power to challenge you know, the church and the monarchy. Um, and yet they did, but they just operated in the cracks where nobody else wanted to operate, and they just grew from there. Yeah. And I, I see these new developments now, these new cooperative develop, developments and solidarity developments and mutualist developments. I see them growing in the cracks in capitalism. Um, and yeah, I just, I just uh, to keep myself optimistic, I can, I can see them growing in the cracks in capitalism in the same way that capitalism grew in the cracks in feudalism. Yeah. And I, I think it's doable. I think, well, I think it's doable. I think what we're, what we're engaged in, I guess, is trying to accelerate that process, make it yeah. easier. Yeah. and accelerate the process and see what can be achieved. But I think that, um, uh, I guess, you know, we've made, we've made some fairly hefty mistakes in the past within the cooperative economy. Um, you know, the whole thing, going back, uh, where, um, you know, the answer was seen to be consumer cooperativism, Mm. And uh, um, support for worker co-ops was was sort of swept aside, really. You know, I'm going back 100 years or more, and um, and so we saw this fantastic rise in consumer co-ops, most of which are, are now struggling. You know, they're you know they've gone through this massive period of consolidation. Uh, so you've got a, a small handful now, really, of substantial consumer co-ops in the UK. Um, and they're becoming less and less cooperative, essentially. Yeah, but that's what I wanted to ask you. Do you think scale is an issue? Do you think scale is a problem? Do you think we need to keep things small and federate them? Yes, I think, uh, I think keeping it small, keeping it federated, uh, keeping it complicated and hard to, um, hard to be uh, subsumed. Yeah? Yeah, 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 yeah. I, th I think, you know, we all know that power corrupts. So I think if if you get too big, it becomes very very difficult to maintain that sort of human level of uh, cooperation, which makes the yeah. and it Absolutely. becomes remote and it just becomes you know that's why why I worry about uh, all this talk about blockchain, right? So the idea of uh, autonomous organisations operating through some sort of technology uh, platform where people are, uh, are voting on stuff. Um, it just doesn't feel like it's a good fit with cooperation. I think enabling cooperation at scale is something that technology could help with. And I'm doing some work on that front with a, with a group called the Digital Life Co uh, Collective. Uh -huh. They're doing some really interesting work. I'm, I'm involved in that. What are they doing? Um, well, they're, they're trying to. Um, it, they're trying to build some tools, some methodologies, some processes whereby people, you know, the sort of new cooperatives that are starting up. A lot of them are, are very geographically diverse. So there's a lot of asynchronous stuff going on. That people are in different time zones, or they're, 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 you know, we're not working on things. People are much more sort of portfolio based, if you want. You know, so um, the whole concept, the whole, that whole sort of Victorian concept of the firm, like the company, is breaking down. Um, so you're getting these uh, the, these much more loose coalitions of people coming together to do stuff together. And they might be together for a relatively short time, and then they'll drift apart or, or move on to other things. You know, so you get this sort of fluid coalescence of, uh, of, of people involved in pieces of work and projects and different activities. So, how do you manage and uh, make effective cooperation at scale in these groups? Trying to develop some simple tools and technologies that, uh, that people can use effectively and, and still maintain um, 
that sort of democratic, open uh, volunteerism, I suppose, that, that is um, that the cult principles are all about. Mm -hmm. It it says on Cotex website that you 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 you'd like to increase market share for for democratic businesses. And that's that's my argument as well as for you know for non corporate that's exactly what we want to do not just for tech businesses but for for the for the whole of the economy really yeah so, so people often say even if they're into you know community energy community supported agriculture co-ops etc they often say well it's only ever going to be marginal isn't it and my argument is well why when when do you want it to stop when when yeah. will when at, at what market share do you think it's going to be enough. Yeah. Don't, don't you want to keep growing it? In, in which case, it's sort of geared to take over unless, unless you actually want it to stop. Yeah, well, that's a good point. Uh, uh, well, I think there's, there's, probably, um, there's probably some psychology in there as well, I think, um, in that uh, it can be quite, success can be quite challenging, I think. Uh, I think there's a, there's a mindset which is about um, being the underdog and uh, and, and acting, acting as a rebel and sort of expecting not to succeed. Okay, mm -hmm. I think that if we uh, you get to a point where shit, we could actually win this. <laughs> it's pretty scary. I think. Yeah, it does change the whole nature of the game. Um, uh, yeah, so, some people are doing that, and they're and they're doing that really, really well. I think, and I think, but I do think there are people um, who are sort of comfortable, I guess, in their rebellious state. Yeah, yeah, yeah. they don't want, actually want to be on top. Yeah. yeah. So tech, tech is a creative industry, and and. Um, Move into the co-op sector or, or starting cooperative enterprises, getting together with other people. That's a creative thing to do. And so, you know, working, working in tech for a multinational, I don't think is anywhere near as a creative thing to do. Right. So maybe, this is my theory, maybe the co-op tech sector has the most creative people and therefore you'd get a better product from that sector. Well, I think, yeah, I mean, there's, there's good evidence to show that I think if people have got a real stake in what they're doing, then they are more effective, you know, they're more productive, they're more creative, they're more innovative. And I think that, you know, there's also some good evidence, I think, to show that larger organisations really struggle to innovate. Um, and uh, sort of by definition become very uh, risk averse, you know. So, uh, so I think, yeah, I think, I mean, what I see in the tech sector is that people, um, people understand collaborative, cooperative ways of working. It's a natural fit for them. Yeah. Um, so there's a big win there straight straight away, I think. Whereas in 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 some sectors, you know, it's total anathema. You know, you see people sort of walking into a cooperative environment and they're struggling to cope. So okay, so who's going to tell me what to do, sort of thing? Um, mm. uh, so, there's, but there's much less of that, I think, in the tech sector. It's, there's a there's a better sort of cultural fit, I guess, in some senses. I think it's our it's our um, it's our big advantage, isn't it? The sort of feeling of solidarity is our big advantage. That just doesn't it can't exist in the in the corporate sector. Um, you know, the corporate sector has lots of other advantages: scale and money, and it has the ear of politicians, and it can avoid tax, and it has sweatshops, and it has loads of different advantages. But our particular super advantage is um, is that feeling of solidarity that they can never have really. Yeah, well, I, think, I mean, they try and manufacture it, don't they? They try and manufacture it, but it's, it's not manufacturable. I don't think you, it has to come from the heart. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, once you sort of poke at it, it it's, it's relatively thin. Yeah. Interesting one. Yeah, yeah, and I think, that, um, I think that's very attractive to people. You know, they like that. Um, and a lot of people obviously will uh, 
make a lot of decisions that aren't clearly in their own favour in order to secure that sense of solidarity. You know, so they'll they'll give up well paid jobs and things like that once they you, know, you see that sort of thing happening quite commonly. Yeah. People work their way up that corporate ladder and then realise that well actually it's just it's just rubbish, isn't it? There's yeah. nothing of substance there. Yeah, it doesn't bring them any kind of satisfaction. Yeah. Yeah. It's um it's really interesting with the people that we've interviewed so far. There seems to be a bit of a common theme emerging. I don't know if you would uh, agree with it, but the the common theme is that there's a crash coming, and they people are desperately trying to build networks to catch people when the crash inevitably happens. Um, do you share that perspective? And and if so, what kind of crash do you think is coming? Well, I think we are in the midst of a long, slow crash. I think it started some time ago. Perhaps the you know, perhaps the financial crash ten years ago um, was was the first big evidence that we saw that that was happening. But we we've, we've got, and I think that yeah. So I mean, nothing's happened really since. You know, that, that shows me that anything else is happening other than that sort of process of, of decline. Um, you know, you hear all these stories about how um, how capitalism is very flexible and able to adapt and uh, and continue to sort of thrive in different circumstances. But actually, what we're seeing, I think, is uh, you know through this whole process of, uh, of financialization that we've seen over the last decade or so, is that there's so much. So much wealth has been sucked out of the real economy into this sort of, uh, stratospherical financial layer um, that the real economy is now on its knees. Well, you mentioned Douglas Rushkoff earlier, and uh, I read his book, um, Throwing Rocks at the Google Bus. Oh, yeah. And, and he reckons that um, so the, the, the currency speculation and the derivatives markets, which are basically gambling, they're totally unproductive. Yeah. They're 10 times the size of the actual real productive economy, yeah. which I found incredible. Yeah. And so it's you, all you, parasit parasitic on the back of the real economy. It is, yeah, it's absolutely the, the case. And that was the cause of the financial crash in 2007 8, was the the, all this speculation and gambling going on, going on based on these, uh, I can't remember the jargon, uh, you know, sort of the uh, collateralized debt obligations, uh, yeah. obligations, whatever they called it, yeah, that, that, that were just sort of, there was no foundation to it, obviously. And that became apparent because the whole thing then just imploded. And, but none of those lessons have been learned. All those speculators, all those gamblers, Operating in that sort of, uh, that other space, that it has no bearing on the real economy, but but other than it's sucking wealth out, it's hoovering the value out of the real economy. You know, uh, so the ordinary people are um, haven't really seen any sort of major improvement in the quality of their life for several decades now. Mm. Um, I think the, the I've seen reports, you know, sort of, uh, videos and stuff I've watched of talking about the U.S. Uh, uh, market, and they're saying that you know real wage growth stalled in, in something like 1976 in the U.S. economy, uh, at, at which point um, people then started borrowing in order to fund the, the improvements in their quality of life. So, and that's when the uh, sort of credit card, card industry took off. Yeah. So ordinary working people are no longer seeing real terms uh, growth in their, in their incomes, and they were then, they're now starting to rely on, uh, on borrowing in order to fund their lifestyle. Mm -hmm. That's been the same ever since. Mm. It's a very specific it's question. Astronomical numbers in terms of... Uh, personal debt and uh, unsecured debt. Yeah. It's a, a very specific question for you. Do you use Lumio? 
Uh, yeah, yeah. And uh, how do you find it? Is it is it difficult for for? Uh... No, I think it. I mean, it has its frustrations, uh, like most tools, but I think it's it's quite useful. Um, and I think I'm hoping that uh, I think the, the folks that um, run it have secured some more funding recently. So I'm hopeful that there'll be some more development of that platform to further improve. Well, it's, a, like a, it's a decision-making tool, um, that right? And, and what's special about it? Um, well, it's well, it's sort of founded. The, the sort of principles underlying it are ones about sort of democracy and using uh, ideas from sociocracy, I guess, to, uh, to facilitate the decision making and the deliberation. Um, and obviously, the people that uh, that run it, you know, the company behind it, is uh, worker owned. Really cool. Yeah. In the, uh, in New Zealand, part of the Inspiral Network. Mm -hmm. which, uh, which is uh, an interesting group. Um, some of the people I've talked to, like Simon Fairley and Dave King, spring to mind. They, um, they, they're sort of looking for the it, the 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 special thing, the catalyst, or whatever it is, that's going to really turn the tide. Have you any ideas about what that might be? I don't. I don't think there's any sort of silver bullet. Um, you don't. No, I think that I think there's a what we've what we've got in in terms of this sort of alternative uh, economy or whatever you want to call it. There is uh, an enormous amount of fragmentation. Always has been. It's always been the case. Yeah, you know, if you look at the uh, if you just look at the sort of political aspect, you know, there's sort of uh, on the uh, Organisations and groups and, uh, on the left uh, are incredibly fragmented and splintered, and, and um, there does seem to be uh, a real challenge there in terms of finding common ground and um, collaborating, understanding what the key fundamentals are, and, and working effectively together to make progress. So I, th I don't think it's any magic thing that's going to tip the balance. I think it's down mm. to um, it's down to cooperation, the process. You know, people working together, understanding what their common needs are, and working to deliver them, and creating real economic power through that process. Yeah, so we can create real economic power then we can make substantial change to the to the game. Yeah. I'm 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 not saying that it's a silver bullet, but I do I do think that the mutual credit idea is um is a very interesting one and it could be <clears throat> a kind of a catalyst. Yeah. Uh, well I uh, I'm sure, yeah, what because something like that is a real enabler, isn't it? So if we if we can make that work and there's no reason why it couldn't work, um, then it could accelerate the development of a lots of these organizations yeah 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 and enable them to get stuff done but it's you know it's, it's only going to work on trust it can't work through any other mechanism yeah um yeah, yeah. so building that trust and building that cooperation is is absolutely critical that's the that's the sort of underlying stuff that needs to be in place yeah so we're we're going to try and build this uk Neutral credit network. Um, do you think that working with Cotec could? Is there any way that that could help sort of accelerate the process? Well, um, yeah, I don't see why not. I mean, I, I guess you know, I mean, Cotec would sort of uh, must be pushing forty organisations there with a collective turnover of God knows, you know, a good few million, I suppose. Um, so they could be looking at potentially sort of an internal mutual credit network um, as, a, as a means of perhaps uh, facilitating some of the stuff that's happening. And uh, uh, you know, that could be a base point that you could build out from. I mean, in terms of a, 
I mean, I, I don't know what your what your thoughts are in terms of the mutual credit network. My own thinking, I guess, is that it needs to be an, uh, a, a collective of uh, sort of federated collectives. You know, so, so, uh, so relatively small uh, schemes, so that you, you can maintain that sort of. Uh, I know the. I know this firm. I trust them. You know, uh, and you can sort of work together on that human scale. Yeah. Uh, so that you've got that trust there, and then you know, sort of federate those together in some way, so that that makes makes some sense. Yeah, it would be great to get some of the some of the organizations like the phone co-op or co-op energy involved so that people always had somewhere to spend their credits. They, you know, they need to telephony and they need energy. And so it's, yeah. it's always there. And that's more of a, more of a national thing. Yeah. But I guess those sorts of things will come in time. You know, you need to sort of, you know, you need to sort of start out small, prove the concept, establish some credibility, I guess, yeah. And you can sort of grow from there, and uh, you know, it can, it can, it can uh, scale up from that sort of process. So something like the phone cart, for example, you know, they could be perhaps convinced over a period of time, whereby you could say, well, you could, you could pay ten percent of your phone bill in credit tokens or whatever, you know, um, rather than in cash. Mm -hmm. um, they're not they're not overexposed, but there's still that channel, as you say, um, for moving, keeping things fluid. So yeah, I mean, I think I, I think it's certainly a key part of the jigsaw. I don't think it's the only part. Um, I think there's yeah things like mutual credit network, things like I don't know what what other people think, I suppose, but um, my own sense over time. Uh, is that in a lot of uh, in a lot of different areas? I mean, I'm very much from the cooperative sector, but other people have come from different places, and I, I get the sense that from those other perspectives, the idea of using a cooperative as the business model, as the structural model, is sort of. Uh, is, doesn't really figure too highly on their on their list of priorities. If you're going to organise collectively, I think that that you have to do it using the portrait model because it's it not only is it effective, but it it is in itself a game changer. It's that's not a, that's, means to an end. It is also an end in itself. That's certainly going to be our model. Um, and um, yeah, but if we are going to network, we, we might have to network with, uh, you know, lots of organizations that are not cooperatives. Yeah, yeah. But that, I think the mutual credit concept, um, if, it, if it grows, um, it actually sort of squeezes out money altogether. So there's nothing there to extract. You can't really extract the credits. There are credit limits and debit yeah, yeah. limits. And it, builds, it builds a lot of uh, resilience, doesn't it? In, it in builds a lot of resilience. And also sort of capitalist firms who try to get involved with it are actually sowing the seeds of their own destruction ultimately because yeah. it's, it's pushing out money. <laughs> <clears throat> but I think, uh, I think the other thing about it, you know, if we're, if we're talking about these sort of networks of networks and small organisations and ideas about federation and all this sort of complexity, then we need some expertise in how you do that. And technology can help, yeah. but complexity is, by definition, it's complex. Yeah. <laughs> but we need, we need some expertise in that. And that, yeah, for me, I think that the, um, where that comes from is the whole, uh, the viable systems model stuff, Stafford Beer and, uh, and such like. So that is a model that is used um, in the sort of private sector. Um, and I think what we need to do is to learn a lot more about it in in the cooperative sector because it. You give, us a, give, us, you give us a couple of sentence overview. Um, well, it's essentially how you. How you can model organisations and networks of organisations 
using uh, ideas and principles taken from nature. Okay, so it's that whole biomimicry stuff. Um, uh, ideas around how 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 you have sort of uh, small operating units that are autonomous or semi-autonomous, and uh, and what the feedback loops are, what the communication loops are, what the information strategies are in terms of how these units can work together and how they can work with sort of higher level strategic functions that are trying to coordinate and uh, trying to look outwards into the environment and understand opportunities and threats and all of this sort of stuff. So it's, I mean, one of the, one of the problems, as I see it, with the, with the viable systems approach is that there aren't many accessible, or if any, accessible texts on how to do it. Now, my mate um, uh, John Walker, formerly of uh, SUMA and Out of This World, um, is an expert in Bible system. We've written uh, some stuff years ago now on how to apply the Bible systems model to cooperative. Um, but that's the only, as far as I know, that's the only text that exists. And I keep badgering him to try and produce a sort of a dummy's guide to VSM for Bible systems. Because I think that that's a, a key part of the mix that we're, you know, uh, as a whole sector, I think we're struggling to understand how you do that effectively. And I think it provides a really good um, approach for how you can design these complex networks and federative models. That we could, uh, I think you know, that's going to be key to it. it. It works in terms of delivering the strength as a coordinated movement, as a coordinated economy that we will need to exercise that power in the market. It also provides us with the, uh, the tools to be able to do all that complex federation effectively. Because otherwise the, the risk is, I guess, if you do it badly, the whole thing will struggle and it will risk falling apart and disintegrating or sucking too much resource out of the, the sort of wealth creation stuff that's going on on the ground. But you need to you need to do that and you need to do it well because it provides you know that joined upness is what makes it really strong and resilient. I think. Mm -hmm. um, so that I think it, it, I guess going back to the idea of you know, a catalyst, the single thing that's going to make a big difference. I think that's certainly certainly on the list. And you know, everyone talks about it. Go well, yeah, we'll just do the we'll have this sort of network of co-ops or we'll do this sort of federative structure or something like that. Okay, so once you start to dig into that, you know, what do you mean there? How does that work? How do you, how do, you uh, do that efficiently? How do you stop that from soaking up everyone's time and energy? So people can Google that then? And, um, or do you, do you know a particular place they can go to, to get more information? I do know a particular place. Let me see if I can find it while I'm on one here. So um, I'll send you the link. Um. Yeah, here you go. I'll put this into the chat. So okay, I'll add that link. And Graham, how can people keep up to speed with what, with what you're up to? Have you got a um, newsletter or a blog, or or is there a Cotech newsletter? Or um, well, there's a, there's a, uh, in terms of Cotech, there's a open uh, web forum, a discourse forum, and that's at um, that's at uh, let's just put that community dot coops dot tech. Have you just emailed those to me or? 
Um, I'll just put them in the chat, but I can send them to you as well. Okay. Um, yeah, so community.coops.tech. There's an open sort of discourse forum there. Anyone can sign up for an account there and um, get involved in the conversation. Okay. Um, uh, platform 6co as I say, we're open for membership. Um, and uh, and that's for people who are interested in starting a co-op and want some advice. Well, from people are interested in growing the cooperative economy and want to get hands-on, either yeah. through starting up a new co-op or growing a co-op or wanting to get involved in that conversation and saying, yeah, I've got expertise or I've got money or I've got a bit of both and I want to help. Okay, I'll I'll get those things and, on to uh, The third one about which is sort of more playing into the whole issue around uh, surveillance capitalism and, and tech we trust is the digital life collective. So yeah, um, um, so that is at, uh, that's currently at biglife.com. So we're currently uh, and we're in process of building out uh, biglife.coop, which will be the sort of uh, the collaboration platform that we're building. Okay. I'll make sure those links are uh, are available for people. 